Hello and welcome to today's webinar, how to implement NDR based on the AWS well-architected framework. Our presenters today are Vijit Nair, who is Senior Director of Products for the Cloud Portfolio at Corelight, where he focuses on building products that extend Corelight's NSM visibility into public and private cloud environments. Joining Vijit today is Roger Cheeks, who is a Solutions Engineer at Corelight and an expert in network analysis techniques and protocols, including packets, flow, Zeek, and logs. And with that, I'd like to pass things over to Vidget. Thanks, Ed, and uh, welcome everybody for joining us for the webinar. Uh, today, we thought we would go over sort of you know where we think uh, the uh, NDR uh, as a solution fits in, in sort of your overall cybersecurity stack. Uh, and uh, especially in for cloud security, how would you design a NDR solution that fits into the AWS Bell Architecture framework? We'll go over reference architecture of how this will all come together. And for the most interesting part, we will go into a live demo at the end of the webinar run by Roger, where we will show a bunch of attacks and attempted attacks against uh, uh, our lab AWS environment. Uh, and you can see how you can see some of this data, a lot more richer data on our systems than you could on some of the cloud native solutions. Uh, so with that, uh, you know, let's jump into it. So NDR, just to uh, you know, set the baseline. Uh, most when I think of cloud security today, mostly cloud security discussions around cloud security focuses on best practices, right? How do you secure your IAMs? How do you set up security groups? How do you lock down S3 buckets and so on? Uh, the aspect of sort of continuous visibility and continuous monitoring is just about starting to evolve in cloud security. Uh, and when I think of continuous monitoring in cloud security, it basically rests on these sort of three fundamental pillars, right? You think EDR endpoint, you think NDR for network, and SIM where all the logs get aggregated and threat and intel feeds that feed into all of these systems. Now, you know, host-based endpoint or endpoint agents are quite common, right? And in the, in the cloud paradigm, you're thinking mostly, you know, where do you get your application logs, where you get your load balancer logs, where do you get API logs and so on. Uh, and these logs and this kind of data provides a lot of depth, a lot of depth into the instances, into the applications that are running, how they are behaving, and so on. Uh, and especially if there is any attacker uh, you know, activity going on uh, in the endpoints. Uh, but they don't provide the, the breadth, right? And for that, you need network visibility. And network provides you, you know, what, what I like to think of as a high vantage point from where you can get an eagle's eye view of your entire environment. Uh, and then obviously SIM is the, you know, the, the logical place where all these logs get aggregated in, all the analytics run in the SIM, uh, and, and, and you do your, you know, uh, uh, you go through your use cases, be it incident response or threat hunting uh, in the SIM. Now with NDR, you know, until recently, network detection in the cloud has been very elusive, right? The reason is in the traditional network, you have a concept of you know, passive monitoring with a cloud and a, with a tab and a span port. Whereas in the cloud network, that did not exist until very recently. So all you had to rely on were flow logs, right? And as we all know, flow logs are very much like NetFlow. They're not built for security. They're built for very basic monitoring of the network. So they don't give the kind of depth uh, that you know, uh, your analysts need in your SOC teams uh, to detect uh, cybersecurity threats and, and, and attacks. Uh, but as of last year, uh, several cloud providers, including AWS, have come out with their own cloud native tap solution. Uh, and we are seeing a lot of you know, folks uh, interested in deploying you know, NDR in their cloud environment, taking advantage of some of these native tap solutions. So NDR, what, what, what are the components of an NDR platform? Uh, right off the bat, you, know, you think of signature-based alerts, right? You, you, you want to detect your malware hash, you want to detect you know, which C2 domain, uh, you know, known bad C2 domains uh, systems in your environment are accessing. Uh, th this is, I think of this as your first line of defense, right? Your signature-based alerts, known IOCs are the first line of defense that you need. 
Uh, unfortunately, these are good to have, but easy to spoof, right? So you need to make sure that you know any NDR solution that you put together has, in addition to signature-based alerts, has behavioral alerts as well, right? You want to see how uh, attackers are behaving in your network. What you know, uh, how how are they SSHing into your network? What what are you're trying to elevate the data from just signatures to TTPs that are harder to spoof, harder to evade. Uh, you're, you're looking at, uh, you know, uh, how what what kind of tools are they using? What kind of exploit tools are they using? What kind of, uh, uh, you know, authentication mechanisms are they using to get into SSH? Uh, what kind of certificates are they using to authenticate their uh, access? Uh, these all sort of plump into behavioral-based analytics, and and depending on some of these behaviors, you can generate sort of high-quality alerts uh, from uh, from your environment. Now, once you have these alerts and insights, uh, the next step obviously is you, you want your analyst to be able to triage it. Uh, and for that, you need extremely high quality, high signal data from, from your environment. You need context that is very relevant to the alerts that have been generated. Uh, and, and this is where a lot of the NDR solutions fall apart because the, the data that you need uh, needs to be you know, very specific to your environment data that can be enriched uh, within your environment, uh, you know, based on, uh, you know, be it whitelists or blacklists or CMDB or whatnot. Uh, and this is the context that analysts can use to do, you know, incident response and threat hunting, right? Uh, and finally, you know, once you have investigate beyond investigation, uh, the, the absolute last line of defense that you have is raw packet capture. You know, obviously, Nobody likes to go to raw packet capture, but there are always there will always be a case, there will always be an instance where you have all but some you know specific data that you need, uh, and for that you need to have you know some level of packet capture, uh, and you need to ensure that the NDR solution has you know is able to retain the kind of data that you need for as long as you need it without blowing out your budget, without blowing your bank. Uh, so this is sort of how I think about, you know, what are some of the key components uh, of an NDR platform. Uh, and, you know, we've been uh, talking to some of our, you know, key customers out there. Uh, these are sort of large, sophisticated enterprises that have been deploying NDR solution for a while. Uh, and when they deploy, you know, an NDR solution in their environment, they are trying to replicate a very standard design pattern. And most, you, most likely the design pattern is typically based on open source solutions, right? Because open source solutions gives them something that is non-proprietary, something that they can actively build on. And most importantly, it gives them uh, the community feedback, right? It gives them a, a lot more uh, sort of active collaboration and uh, development in the community that they can bring back into their environment. So be it, you know, uh, any new exploit or attack that comes out, uh, there is a, a community development to to detect that uh, in the in the environment using these kind of tools. Uh, so, the the design pattern for an NDR looks something like this. You know, at the bottom you have uh, a tap or a span port that's usually fed through some kind of a packet broker. In case of AWS or any of the cloud providers, it'll be the 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 native cloud native tap. You know, we call it traffic metering. Uh, this will feed your, you know, passive visibility stack, right? So now we're talking passive visibility, not active visibility, not firewalls and IPSs and so on. Uh, these are the passive visibility tools that give you, you know, something like Suricata that gives you signature based alerts, uh, something like Zeek that gives you signature uh, and behavioral based alerts. Uh, uh, something like Zeek that provides a lot more data, you know, in, in addition to just alerts and notices, it generates a lot more data, structured metadata that is, you know, uh, looking at the protocols that are running in your network uh, and bubbling up what is very germane, very relevant uh, for security responders, for incident responders. Uh, and finally, you have something like PCAP that, you know, uh, is able to selectively capture uh, packets in your environment. Uh, and then finally, a lot of this data goes up, collects up into a SIM uh, where, uh, uh, you know, the, the responders themselves can either run analytics on it or, you know, run active um, uh, searches through the data 
uh, as a part of an incident response or case threat hunting protocol. So, so far, you know, we've talked about what an NDR is and what a design pattern for an NDR is. We have a very similar design pattern uh, for what a cloud native solution looks like, right? So, uh, and, and since you're all on this call and I'm sure you're very, uh, you're all very cloud savvy, uh, you're, you're well familiar with what a, a well-architected framework looks like uh, in AWS and, and what this looks like for sort of general cloud deployments, right? Uh, you, you want to make sure that the resources that you're deploying, you know, scale elastically, that you're not over provisioning for anything. You want to make sure that uh, you're, you know, uh, optimizing uh, to the lowest possible cost uh, for, you know, any, any um, workload that you're deploying in your environment. You want to make sure that you have continuous monitoring enabled so that you can identify performance bottlenecks where they come up uh, and be able to resolve that. Uh, you need to lock down, you know, not only the perimeter of your cloud environment, but as we know, your cloud environment is a lot more open and different than a traditional environment. And you need to lock down, you know, your roles, your buckets, your, you know, uh, accesses into your environment, accesses outside of your environment, and so on. And you need to be continuously monitoring as well for security. Uh, and finally, you know, taking advantage of all the cloud native integrations to make sure that, you know, anytime uh, there is a failure, a zone level failure, a region level failure, you have the ability to recover from that failure. And, and the reason I bring this up is, you know, anytime you bring in uh, this kind of NDR design pattern for cloud security, you want to ensure that, you know, these two patterns blend together, right? Any NDR solution needs to ensure that it stands on, on these pillars of the well-architected framework. Or else you end up with you know what we call an anti-pattern, right? You'll end up end up with a pattern where the NDR solution sort of you know if you lift and shift an NDR solution, it ends up you know uh, conflicting with some of these sort of core key principles that make it cloud native. Uh, so with that, you know I'll I'll jump in very briefly, sort of hit upon what are some of the the key aspects that you want to think about uh, as a part of the NDR solution as it fits into your cloud environment. Uh, performance uh, is a big one for us, right? I mean, and this is interesting in a few different ways. If you think of a, a traditional cloud environment, a, a traditional on-prem environment, uh, setting up a, a tap, setting up a packet broker, uh, you know, wrapping and stacking all your gear and all the plumbing needed for it takes days, weeks, and sometimes months, right? In the cloud environment, you can get this going globally and deploy a elastically scalable, you know, solution in a matter of minutes, right? And this is, I think, a paradigm sh shift, a, a dramatic change in the way, you know, NetOps and, and SecOps folks uh, have to sort of start thinking about how with this new capability that, you know, you can deploy in a matter of minutes, how you might take advantage of this. And even more importantly, it's critical that you be able to deploy this in a matter of minutes because as you all know, unlike an on-prem environment, the cloud environment is not static at all, right? You have instances, EC2 instances and containers uh, and so on, uh, you know, coming up and going uh, down very dynamically, scaling in and scaling out very dynamically. So you need to ensure that you have all the, the infrastructure built in place to be able to match that scale in your NDR solution. Uh, obviously, you, you want to take advantage of all the, the cloud native aspects of you know, integrating with high performance streams, you know, be it you know, Kinesis, which is uh, you know, a hosted screen, uh, you know, event bus, or something like Kafka, which is a managed, uh, self-managed uh, or self-hosted event bus. Uh, and you want to integrate with, uh, you know, cloud-centric sense, right? Because the, the amount of data that you will be generating uh, and the kind of monitoring that you want to do of your cloud environment needs to integrate with all the other monitoring that you want to do as well. Uh, especially for an NDR solution and especially with traffic monitoring, cost uh, becomes a, 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 a major item to focus on. Uh, because th there are several pitfalls here that you, we've had our customers fall into, right? So first of all, when you're mirroring traffic from your instances, 
you want to keep that traffic local to your VPC, right? Anytime, there are, there are very few cases where you want to peer that traffic out of your VPC, uh, because as soon as you peer the traffic out, you're, you're paying, you know, additional cost for uh, ingress and egress out of that VPC. Uh, and, and that cost can become prohibitive very quickly. So you want your NVR solution as much as possible, right, to be native inside your VPC uh, and, and, and be able to, uh, you know, analyze the data within your VPC. Uh, you want to ensure that you have a tight control and monitoring on the billing for your traffic mirrored instances, right? Because like we said, instances come and go, uh, and AWS is not the best in terms of monitoring, you know, uh, the, the billing for these traffic mirroring instances. So you need to ensure, and we have some, you know, partners and third-party tools that we integrate with uh, that can help you track this billing and make sure you're not blowing the bank. Uh, and then obviously, you know, in a cloud instance, you're generating a ton of data. So you need to ensure that you have the, the tools that scale, but the tools that also offer, you know, preferential pricing for certain logs that your NDR solution generates. You need to ensure that there are uh, capabilities to compress and reduce the logs right in your VPC itself before it streams out to, uh, to the SIM. Uh, all of this will sort of help in the, the overall approach of uh, optimizing the cost. Uh, and then, you know, uh, this has to fit within the pattern of your cloud deployment, right? Uh, within the pattern of your or of your DevSecOps deployment, uh, the NDR solution needs to be fully automated, right? You need to have immutable sensors that you can attach, uh, that you can deploy with cloud formation template or Terraform or, you know, whatever, whatever your favorite tool is to, to deploy these. Uh, and same goes for the way you tap and uh, 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 the tap the tap your traffic as well, right? You need to take advantage of uh, you know there are some serverless uh, application tools out there that we integrate with uh, that allow our customers to uh, you know tap all the instances that come up you know within a VPC or that have a certain tag on them, right? That ensures that every instance in your environment stays compliant, uh, you have network level visibility uh, into uh, sort of every instance that is coming up and, and going down in your environment. Uh, and then finally, you know, if, if with all the automation, you can get all of this sort of integrated and going, but you, you need a console, right? You need a, a pane of glass to be able to manage uh, what could potentially be sort of hundreds of sensors spread across hundreds of VPCs in your environment. Uh, the uh, security obviously is a major pillar, uh, and obviously, you know, any NDR solution sort of is integral to the security of your environment. But here, you're talking specifically about security of the NDR solution itself, right? So, you need to ensure that you're restricting uh, access to the uh, NDR uh, to anything that you deploy, you know, based on least privilege of your organizational RBAC. Uh, any solution that you deploy needs to restrict uh, what the IAM rules themselves can do. Uh, you, you know, a ton of audit logging uh, in these solutions that integrate with cloud-based audit logging as well, so that any changes uh, are tracked. Uh, and finally, uh, it, you're going to generate a lot of data, uh, and all the data needs to stay encrypted, you know, at rest and in motion. Uh, so any solution that you implement needs to ensure that that's uh, happening as well. Uh, and then, you know, reliability obviously is, is something where you need to ensure that whenever you're deploying a system, you know, any, there are SLAs that you will have your instances and, and your cloud providers meet, uh, but anytime a region goes down, a zone goes down, a AZ goes down, uh, it, you have to make sure that your security visibility and your security stack is not impacted. Right, so any solution that you deploy needs to fit fit within that framework as well. Uh, so that sort of you know is a very quick walkthrough of how an NDR solution, an NDR design pattern, should fit with a cloud native design pattern. Uh, and we've had several you know of our customers deploy this. Uh, you know, this is a uh, FSI customer that deployed uh, you know a core light solution as an NDR. Uh, in, in this kind of uh, um, uh, architecture where, you know, they were mirroring traffic from, you know, multiple VPCs, uh, VPCs that span multiple availability zones, uh, and all the traffic, uh, you know, 
hit the, the NDR uh, solution here, which is CoreLife, in that same VPC itself. Uh, packet stream or uh, logs streamed out from the CoreLife solution goes into a high performance, uh, you know, uh, Kinesis Firehose, which allows you to process, you know, billions of events uh, a day. Uh, and then from there, multiple subscribers can pull from uh, that high performance Kinesis stream. Uh, so again, you know, a very brief uh, and very quick walkthrough of uh, what a, a design pattern looks like on the NDR side, on the cloud native side, how all of this might come together into a reference design. And I walk through all of this very quickly so that, you know, we have plenty of time for uh, Roger here to uh, help walk us through an actual demo, which I think would be super interesting. So with that, I'm going to hand off to Roger. Roger, take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen here. Okay, hopefully you guys can see that. Yep. Confirm, okay, great. Let's go to this. So let's talk a little bit about the environment before we before we jump into uh, what I'm actually gonna show you on the demo side. So uh, critical to understand what the VPC mirror uh, setup looks like. So uh, to set up a VPC mirror, so these are, um, localized to your uh, AWS VPC, uh, you will need three components. Uh, the first is a mirror target, which in this case will be a core light sensor. So essentially this is a, an, a virtual appliance that will be receiving packets from the AWS mirror. Uh, all mirrors require a filter. As you can see here, mine is just a capture all, but if you were looking for very uh, protocol specific workloads or only wanted to do analysis on certain types of packets, you could implement that in a, in a filter here. Lastly, you would set up your mirror uh, sessions. So a session is simply a source, a filter, and a destination. Uh, in this case, you can have multiple sources to a single destination. So as you can see here, all of these source nodes are actually being packet replicated via their ENI through my filter and onto the target, which is the CoreLight appliance. So this is what the demo lab looks like. You'll see some or all of these hosts in the demo. Uh, I'm gonna start in the sensor. Uh, one of the capabilities that's not readily available in the sensor UI, because it's implemented in the CLI, is the ability to use an IAM access role. So this is the AWS preferred method to give an instance access to backend services like S3 or Kinesis or CloudWatch or uh, any other services that you don't want to define any other way. So this is the preferred method to do that uh, and that's supported natively on the sensor. So let's take a look at what a sensor interface looks like. Uh, this is the home page. Uh, as you can see, I've implemented multiple exports here to native AWS cloud services. Uh, the first being Kinesis. So this is again uh, a, a hosted bus service, so the data can be grabbed by multiple tools. Uh, in my case, I'm going to show you uh, Splunk as the interface, uh, but you could grab this from other AWS services like Athena, or you could grab it uh, from a data lake type of service to, to pull the data in for uh, you know AI and ML workloads. And then uh, S3, so uh, a great way to archive your data, right? So we all have uh, a compliance requirement in, in many cases to store data for uh, a, a set number of months or years. The easiest way to do that is to dump it to S3 right away and archive it into Glacier. So that not only is it the easiest, it's also coincidentally the cheapest. So we natively export that. Now that is a forked um, data export. So these are, the appliance itself is actually sending to Kinesis and S3 at the same time. So there's no, um, 
no need to replicate the data outside of the Corelight appliance itself. Uh, now you're gonna see a third one he, uh, here as it relates to AWS, uh, S3 file export. So one of the capabilities of the sensor itself is to do file extraction off the wire. Uh, and this allows you to enable uh, sandbox analysis for malware or even file detonation for executables uh, if you choose to do so by just dumping them into an S3 bucket and allowing your tool to pick them up from there. Uh, so really powerful use cases for uh, file export and file analysis. Uh, so I'm gonna jump in to what this data looks like. And again, we're, we're, we're focused on SSH here. I don't want, I don't want us to get uh, tunnel vision that we only do analysis on SSH. Really the purpose of this is to show you the rich metadata around SSH uh, because SSH is so prevalent in AWS workloads. Uh, so uh, this is a view of the data and you can see here that, that we're way past the flow record, right? Uh, see, we're, we're grabbing uh, client information, right? The, that's the SSH client itself. Uh, we're grabbing compression algorithms if they exist. Uh, we're we're uh, grabbing encryption information, uh, hashes from the servers, hash algorithms, and then lastly, we're doing inferences. So I want to I'm going to pivot back to the sensor here to talk about what an inference is and why it matters to you. So uh, we we support a a, a package uh, um, analysis within Corelight. So in this case. Uh, we have a ton of core packages here. Some of them were written uh, by AWS, actually contributed as an open source project and then vetted by us for the sensor itself. Uh, but in this case, we're talking about encrypted traffic analysis. Uh, and when I say that, uh, I mean traffic that's never been decrypted. Uh, we are now performing analytics to determine what happened in those sessions. So imagine a world where you can determine definitively if someone is interactively typing in an SSH session. Uh, imagine that you could determine if that was a reverse uh, reverse shell session. Uh, imagine being able to definitively say that a file was transferred within that session, right? So most other tools are gonna rely on byte count to determine whether a file was moved or not. Uh, we're actually able to look at bit level pattern matching to determine these behaviors. Uh, so there's a, a ton of these. Let me walk through uh, some of the ones that we've seen. Uh, now, there's codes for these, uh, but they all have a name. So you can see here, uh, there, there's a lot of port scanning and, and scanning going on. This is prevalent in AWS environments, and, and it's very hard to avoid without filtering uh, SSH from source IPs. In this case, we didn't do that. Uh, down here at the bottom, though, is some, some activity that, that we actually initiated, right? So we can actually tell if, if you're using public key authentication or if you're using username and password. Uh, we can, again, we can see keystrokes, uh, we can see automated password authentication, uh, or and we can see automated interaction, right? So if someone launches a script within a, a shell session, we can determine that that occurred. Uh, now, this is the raw data. Putting that into some analytics, we can actually look for things over time. Uh, this is actually the Bastion host that I showed you. Uh, in the slide deck. And you can see we have a ton of activity around this host. Uh, again, we did open it to the internet so that some of these uh, things would happen. Uh, now, comparatively, if you wanted to see what you might get from Flow, uh, this is the actual guard duty uh, log footprint for this particular instance. So as you can see, not only do, do, we, do we really not catch all of the scanning that was occurring on this host, we actually missed a ton of alerts, right? So there's a ton of interaction with this host that simply isn't, isn't um, detectable via a flow record. Uh, unfortunately for guard duty as well, uh, there's no drill down, right? So there's no drill down. So even if you were using guard duty and VPC flow, uh, so guard duty would give you this and then VPC flow would give you something like this, right? So now looking at the data set here, you can look at the raw data and determine right away uh, that, that it's just simply not as rich, right? It, it, it's not gonna be able to uh, enable the detection mechanisms that you can do with uh, Corelight. So another thing that, that jumps out at me uh, that, that Corelight provides uh, or you know NDR provides is actually the ability to determine uh, whether it's SSH or not. So because we're looking at packets and we're layer seven aware, I can actually look for information uh, that would tell me that something bad is happening. So as you can see here, 
This is actually traffic on port 22 using, that is not actually SSH. So now I can go and see who those uh, individuals were. Now, a lot of this is internet, as we mentioned already, that there's a lot of scanning going on. And, and some of this was, was myself actually doing uh, NMAP to generate traffic here. But being able to determine the difference between a protocol and not a protocol on a specific port is hugely powerful. Uh, and this is not limited to SSH. Uh, this is relevant in DNS, RDP, SMB. So these protocols, being protocol aware is hugely, hugely powerful. So I'm gonna jump back. Uh, I'm gonna jump out of the live demo and back into uh, slides here. And we're going to have a call to action. So if you want to try the Corelite AWS uh, AMI or Corelite Software Sensor, we have an evaluation form that will get you a trial license to try these things uh, and get the data into your own environment and do some analytics and see how powerful it is uh, as it compared to other solutions. So I'm going to open it up to Q&A. I know we saw some coming in. Actually, I think maybe there's just a couple. Uh, the first question that, that I already answered in the chat, but I'll read out here, is, is, is Corelight an agent? And no, no, Corelight's not an agent. We're actually receiving packets from the port mirror to an appliance, which is either an AMI or software on Linux, uh, which would have a, a management interface and a listening interface to accept that traffic. Uh, uh, Ed or, or Vidya, do you guys have other questions that, that you guys got? Yeah, there's one other question. Is the mirror only available on Nitro instances? And uh, I believe there are plans to expand it to other instances as well. I believe AWS is working on it, um, but uh, timeline is something best to check with your AWS account. I hear it's going to be soon. Very good. Well, thank one, you very much. Other, and I'll pass back to you. One, uh, Roger, I think it would be valuable just to, on the, the screen that you had earlier, sort of uh, flash up some of the SSH inferences and maybe talk about it for um, briefly. Yeah. So let's talk about the ones that were relevant to my specific Bastion host. And you'll see that there's some very good activity here. So the top ones here were scan activity from the internet. Uh, but as you can see here, uh, I did move files around. I did upload uh, a small and large file to this instance. And you can see that those were detected. Uh, keystrokes were also detected. And, and of course, we're validating here that we're using public key authentication, which is again, uh, an AWS best practice, right? So if we had seen username and password authentication here, that might be a red flag in our environment. Uh, all, and we'll never know that uh, you know, if we don't have this data, right? So, so again, uh, most companies are rolling out multiple workloads over multiple uh, regions, multiple VPCs. Uh, if someone were to roll out password authentication, it may never be detected uh, without a tool uh, like NDR. So and any, anything else you want to cover here, Bidget? Yeah, yeah. A few other ones we we also show here that uh, in the uh, that we didn't get to quite in the demo is. Uh, yeah, let me see if uh, I can pull those up so you can see them though. Yeah, here's a few. Let me. Uh, you can keep talking. I, I will. Bro I'll branch this out over some more malicious traffic that I pumped through this lab environment, yeah. and we should see uh, a few more of those pop up. Right. Uh, let's see. I'll leave these up for you to talk to, Vidya. Yeah, but but essentially is uh, you know uh, it, when you have activity that is uh, brute force attempts going on, uh, SSH brute force attempts. You saw that guard duty shows you know actual brute force up, but any brute force attempts that's going on, password guessing that is going on, these are things that uh, you know uh, uh, that we can see as well. Uh, another one that we introduced recently is this idea of uh, SSH stepping stones, uh, where uh, you have malicious attackers that you know go from the bastion host to another server to another another server, sort of hop internally, laterally in your environment, uh, and that's something that uh, with the uh, with some of the inferences that we've uh, included, we can detect as well. Uh, and that's that's just a taste of you know all of this we are doing. 
without actually looking at uh, without decrypting the traffic so this is just looking at uh, the the metadata around the encrypted traffic that is passing on the wire um, let's see if I have any of this. I'm just seeing if I have any of the stepping stones. So this is what a stepping stone log looks like. So essentially what you'll see, Vidget, is the multi-client chain here. Now this could go up to, it's it's only two here, but uh, this is uh, what you would see client uh, to client one, and then eventually you would see client two, right? Mm -hmm. that's, so that's what a stepping stone would look like from a log perspective. And essentially what you're doing is, uh, this is actually me, funny enough, this is my home IP to the Bastion host, to the internal uh, web server in our lab environment. So another question that came in through the chat uh, or, or through the questions tab was, uh, what are keystrokes in SSH? So keystrokes are actually uh, interactive typing, which is what you would expect in an SSH session. So if I'm actually, if I log into a machine uh, via SSH and I start typing, that that's keystrokes. Uh, however, uh, the the there are scenarios where that is inherently bad. Uh, imagine a scenario where uh, we see a reverse shell, and then we see keystrokes. So that means uh, a reverse shell is simply uh, where a scripted a, a scripted tool opens a shell outbound to another environment, giving them essentially command line access to your environment. So if I see reverse shell, followed by keystrokes, followed by a file transfer, uh, that's indicative of a significant issue or, or could be. Uh, simply speaking, uh, I've opened a reverse shell, I've then logged into your environment, and then I've uh, uploaded malicious code into your environment, and then I make keystroke to execute that. Uh, you know, uh, that's pretty nefarious. Uh, in other, you, you know, in other scenarios, uh, it may be time of day, right? So uh, we all we all live in a in a world where change control is important. So if I see keystrokes that 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 uh, initiate a change uh, in the wrong time of day or on the wrong server or in the wrong environment, that that's typically an alertable event as well. Excellent, uh, and I think that's the last question, unless anyone had any more questions. If so, please enter them into the questions window now. And if not, we'll we'll go ahead and start wrapping things up. So I'd like to uh, thank our presenters today, uh, Vidget and Roger, appreciate you being here to share your expertise with us. Um, as Roger mentioned, we do have an evaluation of our cloud sensor, if you'd like to check that out. Um, also, if you go to the handout section of GoToWebinar, uh, panel, you'll see a uh, cloud sensor data sheet if you're just looking for more information. Um, and with uh, with that, we'll wrap things up. And if you're interested in sharing this presentation with a colleague, uh, expect an email from us next week with a link to the recording. And thanks for attending. Hope you have a great day. Thanks, everyone.